Welcome to With You Every Step, the solo travel podcast that explores, explains, and hopefully inspires you to travel the world by yourself. I'm your host, Michelle Lee. Today on With You Every Step, we get raw. My goal for this podcast was to inspire you to travel and give you information on how you can do it. I want to be real and I want to be honest. There is also a dangerous side to traveling alone. Today we talk to Joanna Curtis. We will hear about her experiences while she was traveling alone. The point of this podcast is not to scare you. It is to empower you with the knowledge so you don't make those same mistakes. I want to be very clear that today is about learning. So you can learn from these stories and you don't put yourself in the same dangerous situations. Thank you, Joanna, for joining me. Are you ready to get raw? Raw. Yes, I am. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I know we have been to many of the same countries. That's true. We have. And we have traveled very differently to these same countries. Pretty differently. Yep. Can you explain how you went and how you traveled Egypt? Look, I don't know. I guess I don't think that deeply when I make travel plans, unlike the planners amongst us. Um, yes, like me. Like I you. am thorough <laughs> to no end when I'm planning a trip. Yeah, I don't like to plan in life or in traveling. I just like to go with the breeze. Usually when I go to a new country, I book the first night's accommodation and then I like to just see what happens. So that's generally how I like to roll. With Egypt, however, I was I was living in England at the time and I was working um I was working as a nanny, so I only had two weeks. I booked all of my accommodation because I didn't have the time to just kind of But you only but, booked accommodation. Yeah. Oh well I booked a diving trip. I booked a diving course and then yeah I only booked accommodation. So you didn't do a tour? No, no I don't know. I think, you know, it's interesting. When I was younger, I had this sort of, you know, I want to sort of say kind of an arrogance when it came to tours. I thought that it was like a cop out or that I wasn't really going to experience the country and that I was going to just sort of, you know, be giving my money back into the pockets of of Western foreign owned companies. And I wanted to be able to invest in local people. And so I had this kind of chip on my shoulder, to be honest, when it comes to Mm. tour companies. As I've aged and through my experience, I definitely see their value. I'm not critical of people that do them. But, you know, when I was in my early 20s, you're naive and you're kind of idealistic, I think. So, yeah, they weren't for me. Looking back on your experiences, which we're going to get into in a moment, do you think that you should have done a tour? Because my advice to anybody going to Egypt is always do a tour. Look, n- no, I think that there are ways to travel alone without a tour in which you can be safe or, you know, as safe as anyone can ever be, like there's no guarantees in life. How did you find getting around? Because I know on the tour with us, the men had to organise everything and the women were not spoken to and we couldn't really go and approach somebody and get advice. I mean, look... It was fine and it wasn't fine. For me, okay, let's let's say when I first arrived in Cairo, I get off the plane, I knew the address of my hotel, but that was all I knew. I didn't really know how to get there. I just walked out of the airport and found a taxi and jumped in. And it was an interesting experience, I'm not going to lie. So, yeah, a uh, lovely taxi driver, actually. He was a really, really nice man. And he dropped me at my hotel. I get out of the cab and when I get upstairs, I notice my phone's missing. And I was like, oh, my Lord, what a terrible start to the trip. I've left my phone in the taxi, went down to the reception area, and and they called my number. And he answered and dropped it back to the hotel. So, actually, like, I just – that was a really lovely, you know, welcome to the country. Yeah, I thought you were going to say that he actually stole it. No, he was really, really lovely and really, really genuine. I want to really preface anything I say with – with my own knowledge and understanding that there's no, I'm not casting aspersions on a whole country or a whole race of people. There are really, really genuine, generous men in this country. And of course, like any country, there are men who have other ideas, but he was lovely. 
So that was my first introduction to Cairo. Which was a good start. Which was a good start. It didn't all continue so beautifully. I found Cairo very, very intense. I'm always quite a modest person and I'm re- very respectful of the country that I'm in. So I made sure to wear long pants, long sleeves. I had a scarf that I put over my head loosely, like I wasn't in hijab, but I loose kind of just to show respect. And I'm a brunette. So it's not like I was kind of this walking target of looking foreign. I guess I looked foreign enough because I immediately got a lot of catcalling as I'm walking down the street. And I I walked. Once the next day when I woke up, I thought I'd check out the museum where Tutankhamun is. I just, you know, had my lonely planet and was walking the streets. Which, you know, I guess, yeah, older and wiser is in itself quite reckless because... You don't know what neighborhood you're walking into. Egypt's not known for gang violence, for example. Mm. You don't really know that, do you, as a as a tourist? No, but I find that's in every country and any mm. new city you go to, you've got to be careful with those things. And I think now mm. with having the internet and you can research and you can kind of find out what are the more safe right. neighborhoods. So most of the time, I'm guessing the hotel that you probably stayed in was probably not a bad, no? No, it was pretty gross. Yeah, it was pretty gross. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was going to say it was probably a good area, but no. no. look, I, I think I thought it would be nice, but, you know, found out it was gross. Having said that, it was, you know, CBD kind of inner Cairo, and so is the museum. It's inner Cairo. And it was broad daylight and the streets are packed. It wasn't going to be too reckless. I just got catcalled a lot and I found it quite stressful. One thing that I really find tiring as a female solo traveler is you always have your guard up. You always have this closed, it ends up being like quite a closed heart. It's hard to be open to experiences because you you always got this sort of armor on you, like, you know, proverbial armor. Mm. Um See, where I didn't feel like that being right, part of being a tour. In a group of yeah. people. So, you know, as a solo woman, you, you're always kind of fending off. I do find it quite stressful. But anyway, after a couple of days in Cairo and kind of fending, I, you know, to be fair, I had some really interesting experiences. There was one point where I was walking down the street and some guy started having a conversation with me and he wanted to take me to a perfume house Um, because there's a lot of perfume makers in Cairo. And I thought, all right. So I just went with this random guy (laughs) into a perfume house. It was actually really amazing because he showed me all of the, like, different perfumes of the big perfume houses. And it's like rolling the dice, I think, because you can have these really unique experiences that, you know, are just for you. Or you could die. (laughs) Yeah, and I guess that's the... (laughs) That is definitely the uh, <laughs> the point where you have to make a decision on what you're willing I mean, to risk. You know, now I'd probably choose life, but back then I didn't see it as a clear cut choice. I just yeah. thought, oh, that looks interesting. Yeah, I'll go with you. You know, unless it was like really clearly obvious that the person was had other ideas. I was quite naive back then that I I took people at their word if they said that they wanted to play cards with me or if they said that they wanted to like take me to a perfume house or they wanted to do you know I believed them um I inherently believed that people were good and as I've aged I've got a lot more cynical and skeptical about people's agendas that's a, a good and a really sad thing I yeah. don't know like there's something really nice about the innocence that I had and thank goodness I survived to tell the tale <laughs> yeah that, that is true but I also oh. think trusting your gut Most of the time, I think your gut tells you the right thing. Right. When I was in Cairo, you know, I went through the markets and I wandered the streets, but I know that tourist areas are hotspots for predators. And so after, you know, going to the museum and a few kind of more tourist areas, got to the point where I just thought I can't even go to the pyramids. I did not go to the pyramids. I saw them on the plane coming into Cairo and I thought that'll do because the stress of having to fend off people trying to sell me things or sort of anybody with predatory uh, predatory nature just was overwhelming, which led me in to my next dangerous situation. I hopped on the train and went to Luxor and, again, got off the train, found a taxi driver, and he took me to a hotel, which I had prearranged. 
he asked me how I enjoyed Cairo and I was really honest. I said, you know what? I found it really, really difficult. I, I didn't enjoy it because I was sexually harassed by multiple, you know, men. And he said, the problem is you didn't have a chaperone, aka a tour company, but in, yeah. but that wasn't what he was meaning. No. I can be your personal driver. I can take you to all the sites. And if anybody bothers you, just tell them we're married. And I thought, well, maybe just let me think about it. He dropped me off at my hotel and he gave me his number. And, and I thought on it and I thought, you know, I got a good sense about him. So you, at that moment, you thought you were trusting your gut? I mean, I, I, well, I did trust my gut. He wasn't a bad, he wasn't a bad guy. I feel like I'm setting this story up to seem like he was terrible. He wasn't. But I was naive, but we'll get to that. I'm an advocate for keeping things, keeping the money local. I, you know, Which tour- I think is fabulous. Right. Tourism can be a really great resource and it can be a really destructive one too. And as much as I can, I like to empower the people where I'm traveling. So, you know, I thought about him and he seemed nice and I thought, well, I'd rather give the money to him than something else. So... I called him up and said, great, pick me up tomorrow. And, you know, he has that local knowledge and that local insight too. So he he took me around and he took me to all the places. And, you know, to be honest, initially it was absolutely fantastic. I was completely left alone by everybody because they respect the sanctity of marriage. They may not have respected me, but they respected marriage. There was... A problem when I got to one of the sites where I was wandering through just by myself. He'd he'd waited in the car. Heaps of tourists everywhere, really, really like heaps of people milling around. But I get to the very, very back of this kind of this this place, and um, one of the most I can't remember. It's so long ago, I can't actually remember the name of the site, but it's like one of the most sacred places. You know, it's a temple, and there was a man with his flaccid willy hanging out of his trousers with a very triumphant, proud look on his face, staring at me. And I, I'm just looking around. There's nobody else there. And, oh. and by this stage, after my time in Cairo, I'd managed to learn one Arabic phrase, which was behave yourself. <laughs> yes. Etiram nafsek, I think it was from memory. And I was like, etiram nafsek. <laughs> and... <laughs> behave yourself and then, and what did he do i mean i just turned i mean i was so shocked i like spun around and turned off but i just thought how disgusting to be in this religious mm. place obviously they're ancient egyptians it's not modern day religion but it's you know still like it's a place of worship to be out with your junk out like and not even erect have some pride like put some effort into it you know it was <laughs> It's like hanging there, so limp. It's disgusting. It is disgusting. I luckily I did not have any incident, anything close to that. I didn't have anyone flash me any bits while I was in Egypt. But well, again, I think that comes down to having people around you and right. and safety in numbers, I guess. Right, right. And you know, even you having that one person with you, I made a difference. It made, a difference. made a difference. Anyway, it, it was a great day, but later on he, he dropped me at my hotel and he said, you know what would really make your experience in Luxor? You need to get on a boat and go down the Nile. Like, you have to do it. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess. And he's like, I, I can get a boat. I'll take you. And I was like, oh, I don't know, like how much money? And he's like, no, don't worry. It's my gift to you. And this is the point where I should have gone Thank you so much. Our transaction is done. I have paid you for your service and it's closed. And that's where my naivety came in because he said, no, no, I just would love to take you, which I didn't know, but we were then entering into a new transaction because nothing in life is free. (laughs) But hindsight is always 2020. I get onto the boat. We're traveling down the Nile. It is quite lovely, but just you and him, just me and him. And I realize I'm on a boat in the middle of body of water. And I start to get very uncomfortable because he thinks it's romantic. And I, at one point, and then he has like weed and it was just all very like confusing because he was like marijuana. Yeah. Marijuana. And he was like telling me that he was like Muslim, but he was like, had this marijuana and I think I don't smoke marijuana. I'm not into that. And I was just like, this, this situation is making me really uncomfortable. I'd like to get off the boat now, please. He actually did take the boat into shore, but we like pulled up in like a paddock in the middle of nowhere. And I was like, well, okay, 
can't we turn the boat around? And he's like, no, you can't go back upstream. Like, it only goes one way. What now? Like, how are we going to – I want to go back to my hotel. I I, Honestly, we were in the middle of nowhere, and I started to get really, really anxious. He was like, that's fine. My parents actually only live, you know, a little ways away. So we start walking, and then we end up at his parents' house, and, like, there's, like, a 100 people, and they're all kind of staring at me. There's, like, kids running around. There's cousins and aunties and uncles and all sorts and everyone's staring at me and I just felt so uncomfortable and I got really really assertive at this point and I was like I need to go now you need to take me home now I'm not comfortable here and to his credit he did he dropped me at my hotel and he definitely tried to kiss me and stuff like that but you know I resisted and and I thought okay and he wasn't forceful no no he, he respected wasn't when he, you said no yeah I mean respected I had to tell him no a few times, but there was nothing. To like, a point where you felt very unsafe, though. No, no, okay. no, no. He you still wasn't. Had control. He wasn't a bad guy. That's why I started the story. He wasn't a bad guy. What happened afterwards was, you know, he had my phone number and he didn't stop calling me. Honestly, for about at least maybe three or four weeks afterwards, because it was when I was back in the UK, I was still receiving phone calls from him, saying that he was in love with me. Okay. So that, that was my question. So he actually had feelings towards you. No, he didn't. He's, and without sounding cynical, I'm sure he saw some kind of meal ticket. We spent one day together. Like how much feelings can you develop really? You are quite beautiful. I though. mean, well, you know, <laughs> I do have a certain, you know, Joanna is a, is a gorgeous <laughs> looking lady. <laughs> I don't know about that. I just think maybe he saw an opportunity given that I was so naive. (laughs) I'm not sure. He was certainly very intense and he called me all the time. And yeah. And you answered his calls? Only initially I did. And after a while, no, I would immediately hang up Mm. when he called. So that was sort of sad because it was this lovely experience and then just this sort of sad ending that Mm. tainted it. Otherwise I would have said I had a great time in Luxor. And then finally I arrive in Dahab, and in, which is the Sinai Peninsula of Egypt where all of the scuba diving takes place. And I went there specifically to scuba dive. And as soon as I arrived in the Sinai Peninsula, I immediately felt that I could relax. Having said that, I still got sexually harassed quite a lot, but we, we'll get to that. I think by and large it's because it is a, a, a tourist you know, kind of hot spot. It's a diving spot and there are women in bikinis all the time. And so there's kind of a normalized view of that. It's not kind of so shocking. Mm. Yeah. To see a foreigner was a bit more normal. So our guide loved it when we went to the beach. He's like, this is the only time I get to see bums. (laughs) (laughs) Because a lot of the Europeans wear a G string bikini. And so he was loving it. Yeah. But yeah, no, I had an amazing time in Dahab and I actually, I, I'd only booked in to do my, um, like my normal paddy, but I stayed on and extended to do my ad- advanced. The fishies were so amazing and the blue hole was awesome. And yeah, I still got like on the way to the airport from Dahab, the taxi driver tried to stick his hands, kiss me with his tongue. It was disgusting. I was like, what about me gave you the impression? Sit in the car, he's driving, and then all of a sudden he's trying to, like, French kiss me. And I was like, what about this situation made you feel that you were able to do that? I was so shocked. I got so angry with him. But again, it wasn't a situation where, I mean, it's terrible. But once I said, get the F off me, then they did. Yeah. Yeah. He listened to that. Yeah. Oh, um, that's awful that you had those experiences, though. My and, experience in Egypt is so different. Well, I and loved it. No, I didn't have any issues. But first, I, I need to say that I, I did love Egypt. Mm. The second thing I'll say is a very dear friend of mine went to Egypt in a similar fashion than I did without a tour group by herself and did not have the experiences that I had. And she's really hot. She's way prettier than I. I think – Maybe it was a series of sort of bad luck, bad decisions. I don't know. She went to a hostel and met up with a groups of groups other of travelers. other travelers yeah. and kind of paired up. But yeah. she also looks more Arab than I do, which I think does help. 
but also again not being alone. So she was with yeah, other other travelers. She had times where she was alone. I had some bad luck too, as well, but into some bad situations out of luck. I I think it is possible. That's why with your opening question, like, do you need to travel with a tour group in these countries? I know for a fact that other people have done it and done it very successfully. I think it just takes the stress away, though, from those situations and the fact that you might end up in that situation if you are by yourself, where I didn't have to stress about anything because I knew that there was people around me at all times. Yeah, I I guess. Mm. Again, I haven't done a tour the idea of getting stuck with a group of people for me, I'm quite antisocial. I seem very extroverted, but I'm actually really introverted and I can't be with people for extended periods of time without getting really, really anxious. So the idea of being with a group of people that I had no control over who they were and then I had to share rooms potentially with them, I would die. So I, you, I honestly couldn't. You don't have it. to share. So normally when I do it, I pay for yeah, the but single supplement. you have supplement. to be rich. I, I never, know I'm not rich. No, I just but pay I mean, the like, extra you, single supplement you, to stop that yeah, stress but, but of getting stuck I've traveled, I've traveled on a shoestring. When I was doing my big traveling, I was that sort of typical living in – I lived in Edinburgh or I lived in the south of England or I lived in London, you know, and I'd save up working in a bar, like that typical kind of Australian rite of passage. And then I'd take a trip. So I never had much money. And now actually in my 30s, I think I'd quite enjoy it, you know, but back then I couldn't have afforded it. And I don't know if I would have had the social skills to navigate being stuck in a group as an introvert. I think an extrovert would probably cope quite well, but for me it would have it would have caused me such anxiety. I'd prefer the anxiety of negotiating creepy dudes and getting away from them than the anxiety of being with a group of people and not being able to escape. Yeah, everyone's different and everyone right. has to travel to the way that makes them comfortable. Right, and I think it's interesting examining introverted travel versus extroverted travel Mm. because it's a whole different kettle of fish when you're an introvert hostels are extremely stressful experiences for me i absolutely hate them Mm. Um, i love them (laughs) yeah i don't really want to hear everybody's travel stories and chit chat i i just i don't know it causes me such anxiety it's Mm. really odd yeah yeah i've made some of my closest friends from all around the world in hostels yeah i love hostels and it can be a really great tool to make friends and then be able to travel and oh i can't even count the amount of places i've traveled to to visit people that i've met in a hostel yeah whereas Mm. i tend to be extremely antisocial when i'm in a hostel i remember arrived in finland and i traveled down through um estonia latvia lithuania and when I was in Latvia, I went to, the, and of course, I always, tra- I always traveled by myself, completely introverted and in the off season and all the shoulder seasons. So not only was I by myself, but there were no other tourists usually around. And Latvia, not the biggest, not, not on everyone's bucket list. It wasn't like teeming with tourists on, on the off season. <laughs> yeah. I haven't been to Latvia. Uh, great countries. Oh, brilliant. Especially Estonia. No, sorry. Estonia is nice. Sorry, Estonians, if you're out there. Estonia is lovely, but especially Lithuania. Lithuania is one of my top countries. I love Lithuanians. They are a random group of people. The Vilnius crew, you know who you are. Absolute randoms. Um, but yeah, anyway, so when I was in, um, Latvia, yeah, I went to this like place. It was completely isolated, tiny little town, and they're like quite famous for having these big sand dunes. And I just got a bike and rode out to these sand dunes all by myself and I'm out there for like hours and for me that's kind of bliss because I remember lying in these sand dunes and there was like bird way above like so high in the sky it was just you know you could hardly make it out but I could hear the beat of its wings because there was just no other noise around me and it was really blissful and amazing so yeah extreme isolation I'm really up for (laughs) So what other major incidents have you had? Well, quite a lot. I got into a lot of quite stressful experiences in Turkey. That was the other country where I really did not think. Well, Turkey was the first country that I went to alone. I had been traveling with a friend all through kind of parts of Eastern Europe, Slovakia, Slovenia, Poland, and then through 
through Italy. We went to Greece and we went up through the, the top of Greece, past Thessaloniki and into Turkey. We were in Turkey together to begin with and then we split off. But yeah, initially we had a really great time in Turkey. She did, my friend got punched in the face by a random woman on a train. That was quite stressful, but that's by the by. It was it was really funny in retrospect, but so just punched in the face for no reason. Just, just walked up and whacked it. We were in one of those carriages, you know, those nice carriages, you know, that they have on train travel in Europe. And it was just her and I in the carriage. And we were about to get off the train. So the train was slowing down and she was standing in the doorway of the carriage. And I was looking and they had kind of a mirror. So I had my back to her, but I could see her in the reflection. I was just fixing my hair. So I saw it all happen in the reflection. This woman walked past the carriage and she sort of had, like she had a lobotomy or something, like her hair was all kind of short and cut really uneven. And she just stopped, met my friend's eyes, like, you know, square, turned square to her, looked her right in the eyes and just punched her in the face and then walked off. Whoa. And my friend just stood there shocked and then I started laughing. (laughs) (laughs) And my friend quite rightly said, Joe. Don't laugh. It's not funny. It'll be funny in 10 minutes when it stops hurting. (laughs) (laughs) And after 10 minutes, it was hilarious. And you never saw this woman again? No, 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 never again. It was quite scary getting off the train because we were like, what if she comes after us? But no, no, she was just a crazy woman. Don't know where to start in Turkey. There were so many (laughs) rough experiences. We'd all been learning this Turkish card game, Pishti, which was very fun um, the night before. And so um, the the guy, the owner of, they call them pensions, um, the owner of the pension had been playing Pishti with us the night before. He thought we were nice. My friend had done this day tour and they'd all gone hiking and so the whole group of the day tour people wanted to go out to dinner. I said to my friend, you go, no problem. I'm going to just chill here. My stomach was in knots. So the owner of the pension, the Pishti guy, was coming in to check on me all the time and then he's like started to sit by the bed. Then he put his hand on my tummy and he was like, oh, that must really hurt. And then he was rubbing it up and down and then he tried to put his hands under my top and give me a tummy massage. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure all women feel the same. There is something so intimate about your stomach. I'd rather you touch me on my butt, to be honest, than touch me on my stomach. That is... I don't know if it's the womb, I don't know, but it's that is a private place. And so I just was like, that's fine, I need to go to sleep. And he left. So that was like my first creepy. It wasn't terrible, but it was creepy. Next creepy incident was we went to Pamukkale, Pamukkale. This place is known for its hot springs. It's got it's the beautiful kind of calcium deposit place. Gorgeous, stunning, especially in the 70s. Now it's Not as nice, but for me, it was still amazing. So we went there and then I don't even know how we met these guys, to be honest. I don't know. I was with a friend. I was still with my friend and we met these guys somehow and they said to us, the hot springs used to be great, but they're not so good anymore. But there are secret places that only the locals know about. Ooh, really? Tell us more. You know, we, we... We loved that, you know, stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you were like hunting for stories that you could tell your friends, you know, who had the best travel story. So we were like, great, great, take us there. And so they pick us up and there was like a group of them, which again, alarm bells, like a group of guys, like it shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't have ever gone. So they take us to this place out in the middle of nowhere and there was like a fence and we had to climb through a fence and through this field and they pull up this pothole covering kind of thing and there was a big hole in the ground yeah we got down into the hole in the ground and it was quite cool because under there was this amazing kind of cave with these beautiful hot springs and it was lovely everything was lovely up until the point that one guy was like do you want a massage and then starts rubbing my shoulders and back then at I don't know how old I was then I was probably like 20 I struggled so hard with wanting to be polite and not knowing where the line was between saying, get your effing hands off me and going, ah, that's fine, and giggling and laughing it off. And I think a lot of women still struggle with that line. Mm-hmm. You know, are we being a ball breaker? Are we being a, you know, bitch if we say, you know. Are we jumping too are quick? Are we jumping too quick? Yeah. I, 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 st- I think I still struggle with that. 
you know, I've been in situations where I thought a guy's hitting on me and then I'm like, oh, I've got a boyfriend. And they're like, who the hell do you think you are? I'm just talking to you. You know, you don't know. Although now I think if a guy said, do you want a massage? I'd be like, no, get your hands off me. But back then I I just didn't know. I was young and naive. So he starts massaging me and then all of a sudden, yeah, you feel this stiff thing pressing against your, your bum. My friend, she did have a boyfriend and, you know, not that that would have made a difference, but she, you know, she immediately was not comfortable in the situation. No, absolutely not. Um, She was just smarter than me, I'd say. <laughs> she was like, we need to go. And I was like, oh, it's so nice here, Meg. Like, don't be rude kind of thing because I didn't – they'd taken was us here. after you'd felt the – Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know. I was very naive. I wasn't a promiscuous teen. Or adult, I'm still not. And so there was a level of naivety to me. I I don't know how else to describe it. So my stories, of course, aren't going to be another young woman's stories. I was naive. But anyway, so my friend, yeah, was like, let's get the hell out of here. And I still wasn't like, oh, you know, the guy was like, should we go bowling? And I was like, yeah, do you want to go bowling to my friend? And she's like, Joe, get in the hotel. Get out of here. And then we parted ways in the next town and she was going to meet her boyfriend and I wanted to stay in Turkey. And she said to me, Joe, I'm really worried about leaving you. I'm just, I don't know if you're going to be safe. She said, you think that everybody wants to just like get to know you, but they don't. If Mm. they ask you, if you have a boyfriend, they're not interested in your life story. They have an agenda. So please just say, yes, you have a boyfriend. Don't be like, Oh, you know, well, I was seeing this guy. And then we, they don't care. Just say yes. Okay. Simple. Oh, like, fine. I promise. I promise I'm going to be really good. I'm not going to do anything risky. Can't do the very, very, very next evening. Well, she left in the morning. That was that following evening. I arrive in the next town. I'm just walking along the coast, getting a sense of the area, looking along the beach, and a guy comes up to me with a big leather jacket, and he says his name's Elvis, which I think is pretty random for a Turkish man. And I thought he was interesting, so we get chatting. And he was really, really nice. We went to dinner, casual, and then mentioned that I liked the Turkish card game Pishti, as previously mentioned. He was like, I love Pishti. And I was like, it's the best game. And he was like, do you want to go play? I've got cards in my room. And I was like, okay. Oh, Joe. (laughs) What a good idea. Suddenly we're in his room and pinned down on the bed and – I don't think he had the intention to sexually assault me. I think that I, again, it's not like I was asking for it. Like, of course, I'm no, no woman's ever asking for it, but I, in my naivety, gave signals or, or gave him the feeling that he felt that, you know, he was able. He he thought you were interested in his mind. He thought I was interested in that intense way that men like this. I think an average, normal, well balanced human wouldn't think I can mount her, you know, and pin her to the bed, you know. So, mm. like, I but think... pinning was, you to a bed is not a normal way. It was way. a little intense. I should have been more clear. And shouldn't have gone to his room. And he shouldn't have thought that it was appropriate to mount a 19-year-old travelling by herself. How did you get him off you? I screamed at the top of my lungs. And he was living in that pension. So, if he'd have got a bad reputation, he would have been out on it. Because we were staying in the same... We ended up... Oh, we were staying in the same place. place. So I went back to my room and I was so rattled that I decided to get up at like 5 a.m. and leave, skip skip the town. I just didn't want to face him for like breakfast in the morning. I was just felt too disturbed. Um, and, Violated. Yeah, it was really upsetting. And then in the morning when I got up to leave, there was a note on my door. Again, you said it saying he was in love with me and it never felt that way about anyone again not that special meal ticket because we had known each other for about four hours i mean come on so you are quite lovable i'm though. not lovable i've only had one boyfriend and i'm 30 how old am i 34 am i 34 anyway i'm something like that and i've had one relationship so i'm clearly not that lovable but i'm a prime target for somebody in who may, might be wanting to make a different life for themselves and sees this person is easily manipulated because she's nice and I'm trustworthy and I assume the best in people. Anyway, so that was Turkey. (laughs) There was one more. Tell me. 
We're here to teach people on what can happen. I mean, it was another penis rubbing incident. Just, but this guy, bless him. Okay, I will say again, I tra- always travel on the shoulder or off season, which is a very savvy trick if you're on a shoestring, but perhaps not the best trick if you're on a shoestring and you're a solo female. Because in these maybe less frequented countries, maybe it would be fine if you were going to Italy or France or Spain. But if you're in a less traveled, well trodden country, and you're on the off season and you're by yourself, you may find, as I did, that you get to a quite large pension or hotel or hostel and you're the only person staying in it, which is really awkward. So that was my experience in a couple of places actually, but this one was particularly uncomfortable because the guy who was very sweet, he looked like a hobbit, he came up to my boobs, you know, was very short and stout and seemed really lovely. I arrived there and, you know, it's that very personal experience, you know, because it's just you. And it was the month of Ramadan, the holy month of Ramadan. Uh, um, he, he said to me, you know, I'm going to break fast with my family. It's a really lovely occasion. Would you like to come? And so I went along and it was lovely. His family were lovely, was, you know, incredibly hospitable, but perhaps Again, in my naivety, perhaps he took that as meaning that there was an interest, that I had an interest in him as opposed to an interest in his culture. I don't know whether there was something that I did to mislead him or whether he was just intense. I'd say probably he was just intense, but maybe I, you know, there was a bit on my part too. So anyway, we go, we break fast. It's very lovely. And we go back to his pension and we're chatting and I'm telling him about my adventures and blah, blah, blah. And I told him about another guy who had asked me to dance and there wasn't any music. We were talking about our exes and our love life and that sort of thing. And then he had said how lonely he was and how hard it was being a businessman and being by himself and running this business and how sad he is and how his heart had been broken and quite sweet. And then he said, I don't know, I just feel so lonely. And then he's like, do you think you could maybe just dance with me like you danced with that person? Um, (laughs) my voice went up like five octaves. Um, I guess. (laughs) What do you say? I don't know. Again, I was 19 and I just, I didn't know what to say to the guy. I say no. I know. Normal people would say no, but I just felt sad for him. So I was like, I suppose if you really want to. So we kind of like, but the remember his head comes up to my boobs. So (laughs) slow dancing with him was interesting. (laughs) And then of course the erection begins to rise. But this time I guess it's about level with my knee. (laughs) It's quite short. And at that point, the dancing came to an end and I was like, okay, buddy, you got your thrills, enough's enough. So I took myself off to bed and thought that that was it. And then in the morning, you know, the birds are tweeting, the sun's rising, I've had a lovely sleep. I slowly opened my eyes to find him sitting on my bed (gasps) watching me sleep. And I was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he was like, "Is he confessing his love yes, to you? Yes, he was. <laughs> he was. He was. And I'm not that special. I'm not. Like, there's nothing. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what it was. I just, he was. It was so intense. And I was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> See ya. See you later, Turkey. Nice to know you. It was, it was a little, it was a little much. Don't blame the whole of Turkey. Absolutely love Turkey. Can't wait to go back. I really regret not doing a hot air balloon over Cappadocia and Istanbul. Man, that city is stunning. And actually, if you love history, Ephesus, just knowing how ancient that place is, it's cooler in a way than like kind of like Italy or or Greece because there's like, well, there wasn't when I was there anyway. There was no one around and you could really like picture yourself thousands of years in the past, Mm. you know totally washed all those weird things away and you know as I said I acknowledge that you know I I didn't have my guard up at that stage it was my first time by myself traveling I did something similar 
I didn't have the same outcome that you had, <laughs> but uh, I was in Vegas and I was with a mate and he wasn't feeling well and didn't want to go out. And so I said, great, uh, I'm still going out. And being that person I am, Ooh. that I love to meet people. So yeah. I did have a brilliant time. I ended up meeting this gentleman and talking to him and he was an American and he was lovely. And I thought, oh, great. And he said, oh, we're just going to go back to my room and grab a drink. Do you want to come back and have a drink? And then we're going to come back out. I said, yeah, great. So I went back. I hadn't realized they were on a bachelor party. So mm-hmm. there was a lot of men. Oh, bachelors. We, yeah. yeah. We get into the room. For some reason, I thought I thought you were going to say bachelorette, like you'd met up with a bunch of women. Okay, oh, I had yeah. done that. I did that the night next night. But <laughs> oh, right, this okay. night, well, actually later that day. So <laughs> I ended up then going into this room and there was about 20 men. That's frightening. And they were doing coke off the table. Yeah. And I thought, what am I doing? I yeah. have just put myself in the most dangerous situation. So I turned around straight away and said, oh, guys, I'm just going to go to my room and grab something I'll be back and they said okay cool and they weren't really paying attention to me because I made it in a way that oh I'm just gonna I'll be back in a minute and they just went great and they let me go and it was fine but I thought I really could have just put myself in a really dangerous situation yeah they were lovely I ended up actually seeing them out again so I did go back to my room went back got changed got ready went out by myself in the lift I met a totally different group of people that had no connection to those boys, and that was a bachelorette party. Ah, and they asked me to join much them. Safer. And I ended up joining them and having one of the best nights of my life. Yeah. We ended up going on a stretch hummer down the strip oh, with all so alcohol fun. paid for. We met these men that paid for everything for the women. <laughs> we went into one of the best clubs with table service. I didn't spend a cent. All night. And I came back and I just had the best night. But the next day I did meet the same guy that I had gone to the room with and he took me out for dinner and we had a great time. Right. And he was not, he did not put anything on me that he shouldn't have (laughs) and he didn't do anything that was inappropriate. It was actually just really lovely. But I think I am very good at setting the standard yeah. And making sure they know where the line is. Yeah. Whereas me, when I was young, I, 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 de- I, ter- I gave it the name, the pity pash, where I would p- pashing in Australia. If these are any international listeners, pashing in Australia is like making, making out. out French kissing, you know, using your tongues. So, um, short for passionate. Yeah. So I would pity pash people. If I felt like I'd flirted with them too much. You know, and I could, and I didn't want to be rude. I would m- make out with them, which is so sad. Like so sad that I didn't have the like strength of. Mm. So it's, it's quite a typical female quality, to be honest. And and it's sad that we a lot of women have that feeling of like feeling like they have to follow through. You don't be a tease. You know, blah blah blah. And yeah, when I was young, I just was yeah, I didn't have the strength. Whereas now, I'd have no problem, no problem at all. It, yeah. yeah, it'd be very. I'd have a very different time if I was traveling now in my thirties than I did in my early, not even twenties. I was a baby. Yeah, I have spoken about the incident I had already in another interview I did with Helen about the incident I had in Dominican Republic, mm. where I had somebody from the five star resort ring the room and basically tell me they wanted to rape me, mm. and that was the scariest thing that I have yes. been through. I listened to that episode; it was fantastic. Thank and you. Uh, if you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it. And yeah, it sounded yeah horrific. It was horrific. It was scary because the people in the resort didn't seem shocked by it. And that's what scared me. The manager never came and spoke to me about it. Right. They never did anything with my post on TripAdvisor. They never wrote any comments about our apologies or this would never happen again. I did put it there for other women to know not to go there because right. it, I was the only solo person in our whole group. Yeah. And I was targeted for that reason yeah. in a five-star resort in Dominican Republic in Punta Cana. The other incident I had, which was very quick, and that was actually in Morocco, and mm. that was during Ramadan. Mm. And my incident, we put it down to them being very hungry and hangry. We were walking. I was on a tour group. I was with another woman at the back of the group as we were walking through the markets and I turned around and there was a man running at us with a massive machete and he was screaming something. Mm. And we looked at each other and we just 
said, run, and we just started sprinting for our lives. Mm. And we ended up making everyone in the group run, and everyone just started sprinting. And then we got to a big area where there was a lot of people because this was in the back parts of the market where there was nobody. Uh, Then we felt safe. He disappeared. But on the news the next day, there was a lot of reports of beheadings. Crazy. It was a very scary experience. Didn't have that outcome for us. To say that if we didn't turn around and look at him, that it might have, I don't know. Yeah. But they are definitely the two scariest things I've had happen to me. Have you had anything where you've been mugged or had anything like that happen? Yes, I was mugged. I was mugged. And again, it came down to really just naivety on my part. I was in Guatemala. with a, I was traveling with a friend this time, another female, and it was in Antigua, which is a beautiful, beautiful mm. place in Guatemala. It is. And, yeah, and we were leaving early that morning to go on to the next place to Lankin, the Samuk Samuk Champagne. Amazing. If you're ever in Guat- Guatemala, you've got to go to Samuk Champagne. Stunning. But we were leaving really early and we hadn't really seen or done all that we wanted to do in Antigua thanks to a hangover. So we we thought our bus was leaving at 8 and we thought we'll get up at 6 to walk up to the hill that overlooks Antigua, which has a big uh, crucifix on it. I knew to be cautious of walking the streets at night, but it really hadn't occurred to me, which is very naive on my part, that I should be cautious of walking the streets in the early morning. We since checked our guidebook again. Maybe read your guidebooks a bit more thoroughly. I, I don't think we'd read the guidebook thoroughly, and it did say that if you're going up to this hill... In certain hours, you should have a police escort with you. Oh. Yeah. We walk up the hill. We get to the top of the hill. Everything's fine. No problems. Looking out over the beautiful vista, taking some photos. And I had my back facing out to the view. And my friend was facing me, looking up further up the hill. And she said to me, oh, those guys look dodgy. I didn't even turn around to check what she was saying. Just she sounded calm and dodgy. I just thought she meant kind of a bit... Weird, not Mm. dangerous. Within a few seconds, the hair on my arms stood up and I could just feel that somebody was coming towards me. Then my friend started screaming, Joe, Joe, turn around, turn around. And I quickly turn around and see a man charging to me with a knife. And another man comes out of the bushes and he has a knife and a pair of bolt cutters. I mean, they started speaking to us in Spanish, but we could could read between the lines, you know, give me all your stuff. I just started throwing my belongings at him and my friend, I didn't realize at the time, had gone completely into shock. So she wasn't passing over her belongings at all. And I thought she was trying to resist them. And I was like, it's not worth it. Just give them your stuff. And like, I kind of took it off her and gave it to them. And she just stood there stunned. It was re- it was really frightening. It was so, so frightening. It's one of those moments where you just don't, you don't think about it until you're there and then you suddenly like a being in the middle of a body of water with a man in the, in the Nile. Like I suddenly realized in that moment we were on top of a hill. There's nobody around to hear us. Thank our lucky stars. All they wanted were our possessions and nothing more. So once they had everything, they'd sort of stripped us of all our belongings, they kind of gestured for us to run and we just ran for our lives. It was really, really, really frightening. Could have been worse. It could have been a lot worse. And hopefully those men took our belongings and used it to feed their family (laughs) because it's disgusting disparage of wealth in Guatemala. The rich are extremely rich. And that is not even a 1%. A tiny proportion of the rich are so rich and the rest of the people are completely living in just the most abject poverty. So Mm. I I like to view it as a donation to the local community. (laughs) I loved Guatemala. I I mean, it's a beautiful country. Amazing. And again, I had done a tour. I was by myself, but I joined a tour because I I went, started in Mexico and went through all the Mexico, Mm. Guatemala, Belize. Yeah. I had researched and knew that it wasn't the safest for me to be by myself in those places. And doing a tour was great. Again, our tour guide, there were certain places in Guatemala where he gave us a curfew at night and said, Mm. you're not allowed to go outside our hotel at this time. Yeah. And he was very strict with it. And he also did the same thing in Belize, in Belize City. 
I wouldn't ever even recommend anyone to even stay in Belize City if you if you can avoid it. As soon as you would fly in, get out of the city. Yeah. But I again, I didn't realize that when I arrived in Belize City. We'd just been mugged in Guatemala and we're walking up this street and my friend's like, I don't feel comfortable. And I'm like, I'm sure it'll be fine. And then she said, Joe, I don't feel comfortable. And considering, you know, we'd had this traumatic experience, I was like, okay, that's fine. Afterwards, having lived in Belize for several years, I now know that we walked into a pretty dangerous street and there is extreme gang violence in that area and you can be in the wrong place in the wrong time, you know, just like that. So, yeah, I think, as you say, researching the country is really, really important and, and local knowledge in those areas are is, again, very, very important. And I also think if you wouldn't do it at home, don't do it when you're travelling. And like, you know, I wouldn't at home meet a guy and go back to a a hotel room with him and I don't know why I did it then. I would never do it again. I have learnt from that. Not that, like I said, I ended up catching up with him and he was a beautiful man and nothing might have ever happened. Right. But I don't ever want to put myself in a situation where it possibly could happen. And I wouldn't do it at home, so why would I do it while I'm travelling? Right. Maybe the first thing you should do when you arrive into a new town, if there's a tourist information go chat to them and say, hey, listen, I'm a solo female or I'm a solo male as well. Like I'm traveling by myself. I've just arrived here. Is there anywhere I should avoid? Is there anything I should know? You could go into the local police station as well. You can absolutely do it by yourself and you can do it on a shoestring. Mm. But Don't get me wrong. I do um, travel by myself without doing tours. mm. There's certain countries that I won't do that. Yeah. And those countries that I've mentioned are countries that I personally wouldn't go by myself. Yeah. But other Europe, I never do a tour through Europe. Asia, I never do a tour through Asia. So there's certain places that I don't do tours, but there's certain guess, countries personally that I feel safer knowing that I don't have those stresses. Yeah, of course. A lot of hostels hire backpackers to work in them. That's true. They are the best people to talk to. That's very true. They will give you the best advice. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them can be creepy though, <laughs> as, <laughs> as I learned in yes. Scotland, but you know, again, I'm not saying I was asking for it, but I think that there was some, like when you're naive and you don't know who you are as a woman or as a person, you do have a kind of a giant target on your back. Vulnerability is extremely alluring to a predator. So, you know, Mm -hmm. they can sense it. They can sniff it. If you are one of those more passive, you know, I'm not passive, but I, I, I'm a people pleaser And I like to be nice and polite. And if you are one of those people-pleasing human beings, you better make sure if you're going to venture out on those trips that, you know, you're grounded, you know who you are. They can sniff you out. They'll sniff you out. Or I think is it also the way you hold yourself, do you think? No, no, I think that there's a – I don't know. I think there's an element of just – I don't know. I seriously think it's like the – at like the, the in the wild i think it's like yeah. the animal kingdom the instinct you know i think the predator yeah. has a certain instinct and they can they can sense the ones that are easy easily manipulated mm. well thank you for joining me today <laughs> and talking to everybody and giving them the yeah. insight of the stories that you've been telling us about My pleasure. because I know, you know, we have laughed a little bit through this, but there has been times where I can see your face and I can see the memories coming back to you and it's not as easy to recall these kinds of things as Mm. it might sound. So thank you so much for sharing. Hashtag me too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Totally. Uh, Yeah. No, it's definitely, um, you know, it's like sad in a way to reflect Mm. on my younger self. I, I see her almost as a different person and feel sad that, she had to go through those experiences. And I think if there are any women out there that just go for it, then then do it. You can do it. You you can be completely independent and, and do whatever you want. But, yeah, just be a little wiser than me and, you know, thank God for the internet. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Research, research, research. <laughs> That's what I Amen. live by. Yeah. Well, thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to With You Every Step, hosted by Michelle Lee. We do hope you enjoyed listening. And if you did, make sure you tell everybody. If you didn't, nobody likes a Debbie Downer. Please subscribe to get up to date with our latest releases and give us a thumbs up on our social media at With You Every Step. 
We love to hear from you. If you have any questions or inquiries, please email us at michelle at michellelee.com or head to the Contact Us page at our website, michellelee.com. That's also where you'll find all our blogs mentioned in the podcast. We love to hear from you and if we have inspired you to travel. Thanks for listening. Love life and adventure on.